Good morning and welcome to the 20th Sunday after Trinity. This is the order for daily morning prayer with a sermon included. And today also on our calendar, on our Ordo calendar, we have the Feast of Christ the King. Uh, this is a feast that's not in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, actually, but was uh, brought into the church uh, in the early uh, 20th century, 1925, to be precise. And so we'll talk about a little bit more of that in the sermon. But this is still going to be essentially the same prayer book, uh, same prayer service, or morning prayer service, but with a few slight changes. So what we'll do, we'll do it in this order. We'll still begin at page three with our opening sentences. And when we get to the lessons, however, those are going to be found in the Anglican Missal. So I will... I will tell you the, the, uh, what those scriptures are, but I will also provide slides you can follow along, unless you want to mark your Bibles. The epistle is going to be Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 20, and the gospel is John 18, 33 through 37. So I hope you can write that down and have that for yourselves. Colossians 1, 12 to 20, and John 18, 33 through 37. So those will be our two lessons. However, we and so we'll have a collect for that day as well, for, for today, for the Feast of Christ the King. But we'll also be reading as a secondary collect, as we would usually do, the collect there for the 20th Sunday after Trinity. So that's found, just the collect for, uh, is going to be found on page 217. So as you're going through these in order, I probably should don't need to give you page numbers each week, but page 217 uh, for the 20th Sunday after Trinity collect, which will be the second prayer we read today. This Christ the King prayer being the, um, the primary, and that's why it's read first. And that means that finally we have for this day Psalm 2. Psalm 2, very kingly type of prayer, or, uh, psalm. Uh, so that found, that's found on page 345. So mark page 345. It begins right there at the bottom. I will provide slides for that as well. So we've got that. We've got the Feast of Christ the King on our, on our agenda here. And so let's turn back to page 3 and begin our... Uh, daily morning prayer office. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. 
Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world, and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 2 Why do the heathen so furiously rage together? And why did the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stand up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that dwelleth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will rehearse the decree. The Lord hath said unto, the, unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Desire of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt bruise them with a rod of iron, and break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye that are judges of the earth. Serve the Lord in fear, and rejoice unto him with reverence. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and so ye perish from the right way. If his wrath be kindled, yea, but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle is written in the first chapter of the epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians, beginning at the twelfth verse. Brethren, we give thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him we were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Here endeth the epistle. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee the Father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father, we believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. 
Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. The Holy Gospel is written in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning of the 33rd verse. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus, said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we celebrate a feast day that is not in the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the feast is called the Feast of Christ the King, sometimes called the Solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this feast day is an important one that we have on our calendar. The name is pretty self-explanatory. We celebrate today Jesus Christ as our King, uh, King of all creation, King of the universe. He's sometimes referred to, as we use words, we say he's our Lord, he's our Savior, and those titles are also very accurate and true, and he has other titles as well, a King, of course, being one of them. The irony today is with Pontius Pilate's dialogue with Jesus, putting the correct title on the lips of Pilate as he's questioning Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Uh, so you are a king? Uh, we know also that he also later has a sign that, he was, that was written uh, and placed above the crucified Lord's head. And it said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Also, ironically, correct. This sign is an attempt, most likely, at degrading Jesus, uh, mocking him, treating him like he's a criminal who has attributed a false title to himself, when in fact the sign above Jesus' head was also correct in its wording. He is the king of the Jews. Perhaps further, the sign is a, a slight jab at the Jews who put him in this position, put Pilate in this position of executing Jesus. He is warned by his wife uh, in a dream not to trifle with Jesus. He does wash his hands before the Jews, uh, sort of symbolically removing the blame from himself and placing it on them. <clears throat> the, the Feast of Christ the King was instituted by, in, in 1925 by Pope Pius XI, and he wrote, th this is in his encyclical uh, letter, Quas Primus, and it was adopted uh, later uh, not long after my Anglican churches, Lutheran churches, and is rightly uh, a good and right thing to celebrate today. It is an accurate description of who Jesus is. He is our King. In the aftermath of World War I, communism is on the rise, as we know, in Russia. At that time and ever since that time, uh, and very much even in our time today, the push was and is to have Christians sort of um, pull back on their religious fervor. Uh, that's how piety, that is how religious adherence, that is how belief in a higher authority is usually portrayed and, and treated uh, by communists and tyrants and really anyone who's hostile to the faith. Portraying uh, Christians or uh, even religious people, but Christians as religious zealots, um, a bit weird, uh, believing in something or someone that doesn't exist, uh, and of course, and, and then of course, uh, pushing your views on others as well. And they were oppressed more and more, uh, and as we are pressed today, to dial it back, to keep your religion to yourselves. We know how they, we know all these lines. Don't, don't push 
your religious views on other people. <clears throat> and further, the push was and also is today for people's highest devotion to be not their God, but something else, generally the state. Um, that is our highest allegiance in, in uh, that our highest allegiance uh, be in an earthly or a leader or organization or some other authority other than God. Well, that in, in, encyclical that Pius XI wrote, um, he wrote these words, and they're very well crafted. Here is the, here's the, here's a section of it at least, quote, <clears throat> If to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all men purchased by his precious blood are by a new right subjected to his dominion, if this power embraces all men, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. He must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to revealed truths and to the doctrines of Christ. He must reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and precepts of God. He must reign in our hearts, which should spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to him alone, unquote. As mentioned last week, the order has to be right. We have to count God above all things. In this case today, we have to say that Christ is king above all kings. As Christ is our king, he is king of all things. He is over all things. We are to be subjected to his dominion, as the encyclical said. All that is created is under his rule and reign. And we answer ultimately to him. He is king, therefore, of our lives. And above all earthly powers, above all heavenly powers, above all evil powers, of course, as well. The dialogue between Jesus and, and Pilate, once again, is, is interesting in that Pilate really doesn't know exactly who he's speaking with. He's heard that Jesus is making claims to be the Messiah. He's probably also heard that Jesus had made the claim to be God. Um, we know that he freshly had come from the, the courtyard of the ho home of the high priest uh, there a short time earlier, and the Sanhedrin have assembled uh, outside of their usual location, uh, he, going to the, to the courtyard here, uh, outside of the usual time, which is middle of the night, to address such issues as this. And here the high priest asks Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? A more... This, this question is not as clear to us and, and unless we kind of really dig into what these words mean, but son of the blessed oh, is really son of God, of course. And that's probably understandable, but the high priest is cutting right to the heart of the issue with Jesus and his claims. And to this question, Jesus replies, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. One commentator, uh, James Edwards, he writes, quote, The Son of Man here is a fully divine and exalted figure, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, in Greek, the right hand of God's power. Thus, Jesus both affirms his divine sonship before the high priest, and he portrays himself as the fulfiller of the eschatological mission of the Son of Man, an affirmation that sets him unambiguously in God's place. In other words, Jesus tells them that he is God. And the reaction, of course, is utter outrage. The high priest tears his garments. He says, what, what further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy, making himself to be God. So Pilate might have just about that confession earlier as well to the high priest. Now Pilate's asking the pertinent questions himself. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers with a clear statement, which also should have informed Pilate uh, uh, as to who he's speaking with and convinced him, but it didn't. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus says. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be handed over or delivered to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate asked him, so you're a king then? And Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. To which Pilate replies with this infamous, what is truth line, which is still uh, one we hear today. But what Pilate and Herod, 
who also examined him, and the high priest do not see is the truth of who Jesus is, though they either hear him confess it or they themselves confess it unwittingly with their own mouths. Despite the miracles, despite the teaching and the general behavior of Christ, he's obviously not a threat and he obviously desires truth. We always think, don't we, that if we were there, we would have seen things differently. It's always astounding that despite Jesus raising people from the dead even, he, not just the healing a blind or deaf person, the lame walking, but heal, bringing someone back to life. Three total that we know of, including Lazarus and the scriptures, despite all that he did, some remained skeptical or even hostile and completely closed-minded to the truth of who Jesus was. How can they have seen these things? How can they have heard countless testimonies of what happened, what Jesus did, and yet remain in unbelief? Would we have been any different, though, and probably the answer is probably not, doubtful. We only think that we would be different because we've read these accounts over and over. And we're so familiar with them, and we, we can see in hindsight what they missed. But that's only because they've written about it and have explained it to us and our minds are informed about, it, about all these things. It's actually a testimony to the hardness of the heart of man. Some seem to be harder than others. We could say that those who believe in Jesus and what he did must have been converted in heart to see who he really was and accept him. One of the greatest opponents of Christ, Saul, who would later be called Paul, uh, was chosen by God to become a believer in Christ, a follower of him and an ambassador for him. And he, by divine revelation, learned who Christ was. And his writings reflect a deep understanding, a very deep understanding of, of who Christ is. Today's epistle lesson is a good example from St. Paul as he lays out just who Jesus is and why he is to be acknowledged as king and is to be worshipped by us and by all creation. Paul writes, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. Such an astounding passage. Obviously, this is the text upon which the encyclical was based, and it's a text upon which we base our understanding, a greater understanding of who Christ is as our king, why we would call him our king. His kingship is important because by knowing who he is, we are then built up by all that we know about him. And we see the world through this lens. And if we truly grasp the power of Paul's words today, and we, we will certainly be strengthened and encouraged to live our lives in his service, not fearing any earthly powers at all. As the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, already he says those words, and already this tells us that he's divine. Invisible, uh, image of the invisible God. He's bearing the image of God, means that he's an exact imprint and it also says that by him all things are created. Only God can create all things. By this we know that we were created by him ourselves. But further back, all things that exist were created by him. He is the creator, not just of the world we see, but of the heavenly realms as well. He holds all things together. And all of creation is for him, to do with as he wills. To direct and lead and form and shape all events of history whether they be rulers in this realm or in the spiritual, whether they be authorities in this realm or the spiritual. He is sovereign over all of them. Those in the time of World War I when the encyclical was written or those who rule now are placed there by his sovereign decision. They are to rule and govern for our peace and for our safety. They are to do so benevolently. We just read in 1 Timothy chapter 2 in this past week's morning prayer, if you're following through the morning offices, uh, day by day, kings and all in authority and those in high positions, it's Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, are there so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 
So in other words, they have a protective role for us, for the church, which is to put down any and all things that hinder our peaceful existence of living a peaceful, quiet, and godly, and dignified life. And of course, closer to home in the church, he is the head of the body, the church, Paul says. We gather and we worship and we fellowship and we exist as a unified body because we are all parts of his body. And as a church living in a hostile world, we look for his rule also to conquer our greatest enemy, greater than any earthly rulers, and that is that enemy is death. Yet even in this, Paul's words have something to say. He says, Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In other words, he's the first to rise from the dead in such a way as to come back from life. His, his resurrection is unique. He, and he does so to defeat the powers of death and to open the gates of eternal life to us. Through faith in him, we have been reconciled to God because God was pleased to do so in this way, through his son, to have him live and die for us. Christ's kingship is to be of first importance to us in our lives. He is to be acknowledged upon our waking. He is to be our ruler and guide through his spirit throughout our days and our, of our lives. And he is to be present in all of our doings. And he is to be once again thanked at the end of the day for all of his continual care and watchful providence over us through the whole course of our lives, to quote the prayer book. He is to be all things to us because as our king, we have no other sovereign but him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Almighty and everlasting God, who didst will to restore all things in thy well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Mercifully grant that all the kindreds of the earth, set free from the calamity of sin, may be brought under his most gracious dominion, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth ever one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and most merciful God, of thy bountiful goodness keep us, we beseech thee, from all things that may hurt us, that we being ready both in body and soul may cheerfully accomplish those things which thou commandest, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, 
through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by thy governance may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with a love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith and unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we that unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.